Hi, Misha here, and last time when we looked at some ships from the relatively new, at least still kind of new to me, as of Christmas of last year, uh, Star Wars Micro Galaxy Squad, we looked at the Rebel U-Wing, one of the newer designs from 2016 Rogue One, I think a film that everyone enjoys, if it's not their favorite, and it's a design I like. And I think the uh, MGS team, the Jazzwares, did a bang-up job with this. Very few, if any, criticisms. But now I wanted to look at the four classic Rebel Starfighters from the original trilogy. The Y-Wing. The X-Wing. The A-Wing. And the B-Wing. I actually held off doing this video until I finally got the B-Wing in, and then, instead of getting right and doing it, I was too busy, and so I'm a couple of months late, so, oh well. And uh, as I pointed out, too, the old Micro Machines action fleet was uh, something I really enjoyed as a old child and teenager, and in fact, the action fleet B-Wing was literally the last quote-unquote toy I bought at the tender young age of like 17 because it had just come out or 18 or I know friends were driving because we made a we were bored one day and we made an hour trip just to pick one up at a local Toys R Us pre-internet or at least early internet days guys so you know that we go over these talk a little bit pretty informal We'll see how it goes. I thought about breaking this video into parts, but I eh, probably won't unless it just really feels like I need to. But like I said, the U-Wing, or as it was known by Incom officially, the UT-60, was a big hit with me. But what about these? Let's find out. And we have to begin with the Y-Wing. Or, as it was more officially known, the BTL. And this is the A4 variant, manufactured by Concer. Now, the BTL-B variant was used pretty extensively during the Clone Wars. And it had a crew of two plus an astromech. It was quite the bomb truck but was rather slow and while well-armed, not necessarily that maneuverable or quick. The A4 was intended to be, at least optionally, a single seat, more of a patrol, and more of a fighter variant, but still a bomber. But whereas the B was purchased in quite large numbers by the Republic, the A4, not so much. Uh, yeah, there was also the S3 variant, which was a pilot-co-pilot arrangement, whereas the B was more of a pilot-gunner arrangement. So there were several variations. And while most of the Bs were either destroyed during the Clone Wars or scrapped afterwards, the A-4s, because many of them weren't directly under Republic control, were spared. They, many were slated to be scrapped, but were appropriated by the nascent rebellion a couple of years before the Battle of Yavin. And uh, other units were given or helped being stolen by the rebellion, by sympathetic planetary governments, defense forces, what have you. Now, when the rebels got these, they further modified them. Now, some were in, in somewhat poor repair, and also eh, rebellions aren't really good at getting spare parts, so they had to be kind of kitched together anyway, just by their nature. But it was an effective fighter. And they would further strip armor off, even shortening the nacelles, pylons, to try to get a little more speed out. 
In fact, they would often downgrade the proton torpedo or proton bomb load to try to eke some speed. And and they really did. And the majority, if not all, that the Rebellion used were single-seaters, at least human. There was also an astromech. So here we have one. This was uh, the gold leaders from Yavin. It did not survive. But in the beginning, this was the primary starfighter the Rebellion used, and it actually did quite well for them. Early on, the Empire didn't have very good defense against snub fighters. They were able to come in, hit a, a victory, or even Imperial Star Destroyer or Installation, deliver their payload, and uh, get out before. And that was really the Rebellion's big thing, whereas the Empire relied on capital ships and carriers, which there is a benefit to that. The Rebellion had much smaller numbers, and they ind operated independently because their vessels had hyperdrives. And they were kind of configured for longer durations. Everyone we're going to look at today carried up to a week's worth of consumables for the crew, even longer if external pods were attached. And this one here had an astromech, and that was good. This had a class 1 hyperdrive, so quite speedy. And thanks to the astromech, it could usually carry up to 10 jump coordinates and make more calculations on the fly if needs be, although it wasn't ideal. Overall length of the modified version was uh, roughly 16 maybe 17 meters, and about 9 meters across. The one thing we're going to say about Star Wars, uh, sizes are always in flux, so apologies. We have two forward-facing, fixed, medium-heavy laser cannon. A couple of different styles were used. And we had two turreted light ion cannon. Although, usually the Rebellion would just lock the cannon in the forward position, but not always. But the primary weapons were, of course, the bombs. But before we get into that, I like that these have landing gear or landing pads. And uh, they're pretty well integrated where they don't look too ugly. Fold up here. They stay folded quite well. When I first got this Y-Wing, this front one was really stiff. So if you get one, be careful. There's kind of a hitch there. It's working in, but now it's still. So I just tend to go slow and not force it. And it latches. And they do a pretty good job of folding up concealed, but you have these little kind of thumb presses to get them out. You also get the engines disassembled so they fit in the box because, again, this is a pretty large craft. And they are a little hard to get in, but there's kind of a trick to it. They fit only one way, and once you get them locked in, they are rock solid. So don't force them, but you might have to put some pressure. Just make sure you're doing it right and it's going in. This uh, plastic they use, which is honestly a lot better than what we had back in the 80s, is a lot more forgiving. It'll uh, flex before it just cracks or shatters. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that. Oh, you can also pull one of the engines out to see the insides. But the main thing here were the proton torpedoes. And we actually have two in the launchers. And you can even remove these, although it's a little difficult. I usually use like a soft plastic pick or maybe soft brass. And once you get them going, they kind of slide out. Yeah, you do get removable protons. And I really like just having removable parts like this instead of the old spring-loaded firing thing that was really popular in the 90s 
For one thing, they were always way too big and clunky. They still got lost. This is kind of stupid for the most part. But this is a good compromise to kind of really bring down the bomber. Now, like I said, they did usually downgrade these for speed. Originally, they would have held six torpedoes per tube, but often they just had four. As you can see, they're very narrow, so you get, they kind of roll into the rack, launching two at a time. Instead of actual torpedoes, they could carry anywhere from 12 to 20 proton bombs or other ordnance because this was a bomber it was relatively flexible but it was also old so maybe not quite up to date in its electronics avionics with the newest and greatest and the torpedoes stay in pretty good um, if you have problems with them falling out let just a tiny bit of blue tack on the base should do the job so that's a feature we have this now these are nominally 172 scale and it really shows in the pilot we have an opening canopy with uh, a rather roomy cockpit again remember a lot of these were two seaters at least in theory so a little extra room back here for other stuff and our little guy comes out he has two points of articulation the arms move together and the feet but unlike the old action fleet the feet aren't joined which gives you a little more thing and one thing i'm going to say right now and if i don't take all the pilots out i think it's neat that they actually do individual pilots not just paint jobs but actual little individual pilot molds for the different ships when it's uh, when it's applicable you know if it's the same outfit then they might use that but uh for example, an A-wing and a B-wing pilot tend to have different flight suits than an X-wing. He fits in there pretty well. He's got little controls. And I really like that they went for the side opening canopy. We really don't see a Y-wing open in the movies, but, you know, it'd be kind of boring if it was all just the typical hinged and there's a little trick. At first I thought these canopies don't close so good, but if you press in just a bit, it actually locks in and is a very tight fit. So yeah, you're not going to open it unless you intentionally do. And of course we also get an astromech, and unlike the original Hasbro toys from back in the day, he's removable. Remember that on the, well not so much the Y-Wing, but the X-Wing. And uh, there's a button down here. I was feeling it earlier. Apparently this one's a lot stiffer than my X-Wing. There we go. So you can press him up. You can also do a little thing where lowering or lowering him down. And he does actually have a little peg that fits in his base. And while these are, of course, based on the R2 mold, they have different schemes and there and they're very secure as well so what do i think this is a relatively new addition to the fleet came out oh six eight months ago and it's one of the larger scales i don't have a tape measure but we'll compare sizes and i will talk more about uh, the jazzware sizing but I think they did a really good job. And I've always had a soft spot for the uh, Y-Wing. It was in the original film. And because it wasn't the hero ship, I think the designers had a little more fun with it. Kind of giving it the stripped down hot rod. It is kind of the Starfighter version of the Millennium Falcon. You know, uh, not as fast. But they were able to get these up to about 1,000 kph in atmosphere. And... Uh, in Star Wars speak, it has about a 75 shield rating and a 40 hull rating, which doesn't mean much right now, but as we compare to other ships, you'll see that while it's not the toughest, they can take a licking, even stripped down like this. And in Star Wars, a 1,000 kph isn't 
that slow, even if in the real world. But we're talking atmosphere too. And of course, in space, with uh, they use uh, MSL, of course, constant acceleration. You get it. It's definitely not the fastest to accelerate. Has anyone here ever played the Tie Fighter games? No. Um, you uh, you saw this scene a lot in the the early missions of Tie Fighter, where you just beat the crap out of Y wings, and they did take some laser hits. So I'll give them that. But yeah, not much they could do. Thankfully, the turret is not a 360-degree rotation. <laughs> but, you know, I, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vessel I really do like. And um, I think Jazz Wears did her justice. You have no idea how nigh and impossible it is to aim in a camera when you can't see. Anyway, we had to gotta talk about the X-Wing, or as it was officially known by Incom, the T-65B. And we mentioned it in the U-Wing video, but yeah, this was another late idea from Incom. Is a long-range, multi-role star fighter, equivalent to like a F-16. But the Empire didn't need it, or even want it, and ultimately would lead to Incom being nationalized. And this is, of course, one of the first mold that Jazz Wars came out with. I mean, this is Luke's. Although, because of the engines, you could actually, you could argue that it's Red 2 or Red 3 instead. That's one thing I should point out. The whole engine, are they even? Are they uneven? Technically, both. Uh, one of the studio models was pretty much even. One wasn't. And then the toy that Hasbro came out with wasn't in the 80s, and that kind of led a lot of people... Oh, well, just thought I'd mention that while we're here. Why not? It's a Saturday. I'm recording this. Jack of all trades and uh, pretty much the Star Wars Starfighter. So we have the same astromech, although this one is a little easier to remove. It still fits in quite well. His button on the bottom actually is quite flush in the uh, cargo area. We see this can carry some cargo because of Dagobah. It too has a class 1 hyperdrive since it also has an astromech, about a 10 jump limit, and about a week's worth of consumables. So that's about the same, and it uses quite similar targeting systems although slightly newer and updated compared with the y-wing but not as maybe robust we also have an opening canopy opens up a little further than probably would in the movie just to get your figure in of luke I guess you could complain that the rear windows open with it. It should split here, but I, I get why they really couldn't put a hinge there. It would look really ugly. And, of course, we have the landing gear. These aren't quite as incorporated when they're deployed as on the Y-Wing, but then again, this came out a couple years before. Jazzware learned. But when they fold up, they're pretty inconspicuous. Especially the front one. So, And if you're going to have to pick one to look better folded or down, I would rather folded because that's usually how I display. And actually folds up the S-foils quite well. In universe, this is roughly 12 to 12 and a half meters. And uh, about 11 meters wide give or take and uh minimum top speed is about 1050 kph especially when it's fully laden but it's said that if shields are put at full effect it can go faster so it's faster than the stripped down y-wing quite a bit faster than the unstripped down y-wing and uh that's carrying four laser cannon medium power there's a couple of different ones they use like the kx5 or the ix4 and uh, it can carry 
a total of six proton torpedoes, three in each launcher. So actually quite a heavy bomb load. And it's got quite an advanced targeting system, for Star Wars anyway. But unlike the Y-Wing, it's not near as flexible. While it can be retrofit to carry other ordnance, it doesn't like it. It's not meant for it. And it really can't carry, like, proton bombs to drop in. So while it has a bomber capability, yeah. Now, one thing it does have that the Y-Wing doesn't seem to is it does have a countermeasures dispenser in the back, chaff flare, and all that. Now, we talked about the Y-Wing's hull and shields. Well, this one's less. It has shielding of 50 and a hull of 20. So about half as strong on the hull and about two-thirds on the shielding. But it's a lot more maneuverable, a little bit faster, and of course it has more forward-facing firepower, and it's just generally speaking meant to be more of a dogfighter. And that, of course, gets us to the strike foils, or S-foil. There's one position, and there's actually another fully open. Now, how or why would actually spreading your guns further apart give you better accuracy? I, I don't know. It wouldn't, but this is a rule of cool. Hollywood, 70s, World War II in space. Just go with it. It's fun. An in-universe explanation is it uh, gives better heat dissipation, which is true in space. Uh, getting rid of heat is actually very important, and I could actually see when the laser cannons are firing rapidly, splitting them apart, giving them more surface to dissipate heat would be more practical. It's about the only thing. They also had three different fire modes, quad, so all at once, two and two, or you know all four in kind of a rapid pew pew fire which is mostly what we see in the films. And, uh, yeah, it uh, opens well. It's not rattly. And uh, the lasers are actually on the wings as they should be, not on the tips as you see on, like, the titanium and others sometimes. And the dimensions for this are pretty good. As I said, the T-65B is about 12 and a half meters long, and the wishbone here, the Y-wing, is about 16. So the X-wing is shorter. Now, is it exactly, you know, three and a half meters in scale, so whatever, it's shorter? Probably not, but this is what Micro Galaxy does. While they might not get them exactly to scale, if a ship is supposed to be shorter or longer than another ship, they at least try to do that, even if it's only by a half inch or quarter inch or whatever, just to you know show, hey, you're supposed to be bigger or smaller than this ship. And having the pilots at one inch, so 72 scale, it keeps them pretty honest. It seems like a lot of the ships end up being more like a 176 scale, but some are 164 and whatnot in that range. Now, some outliers exist, like the Millennium Falcon, but what, what can you do? you got to have it, and no way can we do it in 172 scale for anything like this price point. And these are priced quite fair, in my opinion, typically about $15 to $16 as is, or about $20 bucks in a bundle with a Scout class. And comparing with, again, the X-Wing is about 11 meters, at least based on the studio model, maybe 11.5. And also S-Foils open or close changes it slightly. And the Y-Wing is about 8.5 to 9 meters. So they, they seem pretty well in scale with each other in the width department. Now as far as speed, uh... You're going to have to test that out yourself. You throw yours across the room at the same time and tell me which one gets to the wall the fastest. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Even though I actually do think the price point is pretty fair. I've heard many say that, well, you know, it's a lot of money. This is 2024. Go to an inflation calculator on Google. The old school action fleet, when they were just you know in stores, were uh, 8 to 10 bucks. 
thing is, the dollar is only worth about a third as much as it was back then. So $8, so on the low end, means today it's about 24 So not much more, but really they're right in the same kind of price range, give or take. Not barring sales either way, in my opinion. But, you know, your mileage may vary. All right, so we've made it through the first Death Star battle starfighters. And yes, we will get to the second battle, the Battle of Endor. But we're going to skip ahead briefly, because about a year after that battle, which was for ABY, the New Republic was founded. And, well, it would need fighters, and while the venerable X-Wing, the T-65B, was doing a great job, all things considered, well, it was pre-Galactic Civil War technology for the most part, and many of them had been put together under less than ideal circumstances. So Admiral Atbor and others really pushed for an updated version well, we might as well talk about the T-70 X-Wing, the immediate successor to the venerable T-65B. Again, the design that started off before the Civil War, but after Endor, even Admiral Atmar was ready for a replacement, at least on paper, and this was to be just, you know, using newer technology, it was not a revolution, it was just an evolution forward. Trying to address some of the issues, keep in mind that a lot of the T-65s were prototypes, pre-production, some were cobbled together in the back room, kind of like what happened with the A-Wing. This was an idea to make it a standard thing. And you can pick which paint you prefer from Jazz Wares. This is the original. This is the newer one. I like this one because it comes with an astromech, presumably R2. Now, I know in-universe, some say this is actually smaller thanks to mineralization to the T-65, but that doesn't really fit for my head. So the fact that this is essentially the same size as the T-65, fine by me, landing gear. It is sleeker, though. Especially looking at the engines, of course. And the way the S foils here, they just fold on each other. Of course, here, they actually kind of envelop each other, making a very slim profile and the way the engine intakes split it's kind of neat honestly yeah very slim wing and that's actually okay um, because well all they really did was copy an original concept from 1975 here is the so-called concept or prototype X-Wing from Hot Wheels. It's a series they did. I don't like the big screw holes, but yeah, notice the split engines. The way they did them. The problem with this is they don't fully collapse in. Only that far. And when you do, it actually has your little center body off center oh well again the hot wheels were i want to say bottom they were inexpensive fun and they did some really neat molds that no one else did so i'm not gonna dog on them but yeah kind of taking inspiration especially in the engine area from the concept we got the t70 in the real world this was uh Introduced in pre-production or prototype really before the Battle of Jakku in 5 ABY. and was in full-fledged production and service 
not long after, so about the same time, maybe slightly after the uh, RZ-2 A-Wing. This was the frontline superiority fighter. And really what they did, okay, new avionics, electronics targeting, sure, still uses an astromech. It's a little faster, about 1,100 kph without assistance. Slightly stronger shielding, but not by a whole lot. A little more hands-off, a little more automation. But what they did was they made it more modular, whereas the original X-Wing really didn't carry much more than proton torpedoes, not without a lot of finagling. This could. It could carry concussion missiles. It could carry uh, mag pulse warheads. It could even carry ion bombs. It still wasn't a bomber. But yeah, you can even have additional lasers mounted. And of course, the lasers themselves were upgraded version. The X-Wing we know and love had the KX-5. These were KX-12s, so improved models. It had more electronic countermeasures, relying less on chaff and flare. It even had some mild stealth abilities, which maybe explains the whole black paint of this guy. My only gripe about this early one is because they made this socket that'll take any droid with this little ball in here. The bottom isn't fully pressed. But luckily, with a true astromech in, this one's nice and flush. Just a thicker profile evolution forward. And uh, this would be the frontline starfighter up until about 26 ABY for about two decades, when it itself was finally replaced by the further improved T-85, which was a little bit larger, more uh, long-ranged, and even more advanced. Of course, it's still Class 1 hyperdrive, all that good stuff. Yeah, I don't hate it. Um, and I, in fact, I kind of find the folded wings neat and they're very stiff on this one of course this one's a relatively new from series 5 this one we've had from what series 3 I don't remember they're not my favorite favorites but they fit the X wing series just fine George Lucas definitely wouldn't have given us retreads like this. He was always good for totally new ships each film. Sometimes at a dizzying rate. Okay, as I said at the beginning, I wasn't sure if this would be a single part, but I think we can both agree that two parts would be better, and splitting after A New Hope makes sense. Okay, we did put the T-70 in, but it's kind of based on the prototype anyway. Hey, whatever, and it's an X-Wing. So next time, part two, we'll look at the Return of the Jedi craft and might have a surprise or two as well. Anyway, appreciate you hanging out with me. If you could, please do like, share, subscribe. You know all the good fun stuff. This is Misha. Catch you very soon. Next time.